Scott Levy had quite a few characters and gimmicks before finding success with Raven, with two gimmicks in particular standing out, Scotty Flamingo in WCW and Johnny Polo in WWF. Scott didn't like neither gimmick. Scotty Flamingo was a surfer dude from Florida and Johnny Polo was a spoiled kid who predominantly managed WWF superstars such as Adam Baum and the Quebecers, though he did get in the ring on quite a few occasions too. Scott continued to portray these gimmicks because he felt he had no choice. Landing a job in WWF or WCW was quite a big deal so you're gonna do pretty much what you're told, especially if you haven't been a main eventer on TV elsewhere. Personally speaking, I didn't mind Scotty Flamingo all that much and I thought he suited the diamond mind stable of which he was part of during the later days of his WCW run. Johnny Polo, on the other hand, didn't have that many redeeming qualities, but one thing was for sure, Scott could talk, I mean he could talk a lot and his delivery was always solid. So solid that he was placed on commentary a few times and he also hosted a few shows and videotapes for WWF. Scott left the WWF to join ECW in 1995 and it was in ECW where the Raven character would debut on television. The man responsible for coming up with Raven? Well, it was old Scott really, but the man who showed him the direction he needed to go in was Diamond Dallas Page. In an interview with ESPN, Scott said, I didn't necessarily want to be a badass because there's so many badasses in the business, but Page talked me into it. He said, if you want to be a chicken shit heel, you're not going to get booked. Nobody's buying that character anymore. You gotta be something different. You gotta be tougher. And I'm like, alright, I'll be the character that I actually am inside, the tortured soul. Scott's mentioned many inspirations and ideas he had for the Raven character. He mentioned in the same interview that Raven was like Robert Plant if Robert Plant had baggage, while also mentioning that he wanted to pattern Raven after Jim Morrison. The name of course is from the famous Raven poem by Edgar Allan Poe, as is Raven's promo sign off. Quote to Raven, nevermore. In another inspiration was Patrick Swayze's character Bodhi, the main antagonist from the 1991 movie Point Break. Not only was Bodhi a skilled athlete, he was a criminal. The most powerful tool at his disposal was his mind, how he could remain calm in the face of death, and he also saw himself as a liberator, a man who wanted freedom in a culture enslaved by routine. Bodhi was the bad guy that you liked and there's probably millions of people all around the world who could identify with his philosophy, motivations and intentions intentions, but when he takes things too far that's when you realise he maybe isn't the great crusader that you once thought he was. The same could be said for Raven. With all the previous inspirations in mind, maybe the greatest driving force behind the Raven character was 90s society and the grunge subculture among teenagers and young adults. A subculture begins and evolves when a number of people who don't want to conform to social norms connect with other folks who share the same views. The grunge subculture, however, went global with many of its themes and ideology still very prevalent in society today. It began in Seattle and it took over the world with bands like the Melvin, Sound Garden, Alice in Chains and of course Nirvana providing the soundtrack to this new cultural movement. And you'd only have to look up some song lyrics to narrow down the general themes of the grunge movement, the things that made it resonate so much with 90s youth. Themes explored within grunge music include social isolation, self-doubt, neglect, abuse, trauma, a desire to belong, loneliness and despair. When it came to dealing with love, you'd find most songs would deal with doomed, failed or damaged relationships. The state of society and social prejudices could be heard in many many songs, and it's all wrapped up with loud guitars and raspy vocalists who could sing or scream their lyrics. Raven looked like a grunger and through his promos we would learn that he too shared a similar outlook to those within grunge subculture. As mentioned, he was a tortured soul. He told us that he was neglected as a child, self doubt about his own worth was distilled in him through his days of getting bullied in school, he went through emotional trauma, he was a damaged individual who felt left out. What about Raven? What about me? 
It all started from a very young age with Raven. He went through so much trouble at school and at home that it deeply affected his mental state growing up, and it's through this troubled youth that forms the basis for the gimmick itself. He dressed accordingly for the character too, wearing concert and band shirts, a leather jacket and tatty ripped jeans. He changed his hairstyle to be a bit more messy and rough, he got some piercings, and he had even sometimes wear light makeup, something he phased out but brought back later on. Grunge subculture, nonconformity, a troubled past and the promise of a bleak future was what made up the Raven character. With a character like this that's deeply rooted in one's personality, Raven simply had to be a good promo in order to get his message across. Raven isn't a gimmick that speaks for itself simply through bell to bell action, so the more promo time Raven could get, the better. Paul Heyman knew how big the character could be, and with Paul being more tuned into what was going on in modern times, he knew that Raven would connect to more people through what he said rather than what he did in the ring. It was also a stroke of genius to make Raven a bad guy. So think about this, Raven's message and Raven's personality was going to connect well with others who had the same ideology. To these fans, Raven was right and Raven had every reason to be angry at the world. But for those who weren't part of the grunge subculture, they might see Raven as someone who just pissed and moaned a lot, a bratty, weak little crybaby who can't deal with life's difficulties when everyone else has to suck it up and get on with it. For fans who understood Raven and maybe felt the same way, he had every right to be the bad guy. He had every right to moan and complain because he's a product of a failed society. It's not Raven's fault he's the way he is and if he wants to take it out on others, then good, let him. In essence, it creates a very multi-layered character that's all about psychology, and it was Raven's psychology and mental state that made him so dangerous. Raven's words could brainwash others. He could make others see how the establishment had turned him into men or women they didn't want to be. He could even brainwash children into turning against their parents. And he had the ability to make his minions look up to him as a leader, the one who made them see the light, so to speak. He was able to bring factions of followers into both ECW and WCW, Raven's Nest and Raven's Flock. Those beneath him would do his bidding by launching attacks and competing in matches that Raven didn't want to work in, and Raven would treat his underlings like dirt because, as he would put it, Raven was the only one who ever gave them a chance. Raven was the only one who understood them, and if many of these guys and girls who joined his group didn't have Raven, then they'd be hopeless outcasts who nobody wanted. This was a little more prevalent in WCW, Raven's flock would sometimes feel like a bunch of brainwashed zombies who would do whatever Raven wanted without question, but eventually, when an opportunity presented itself to leave the group, most members of Raven's flock got fed up and they left Raven behind. Let's look at some moments and matches featuring Raven that I think do a great job of showing us what the character was all about. First, his ECW debut is must see. It was quickly established that Raven was a loner who was dealing with past trauma, and his first major storyline looked to rectify some of that past trauma. Raven had history with Tommy Dreamer. Stevie Richards, the man who introduced Raven to ECW fans, said Raven had some issues with Tommy even before Raven showed up to TV and Tommy became Raven's target from the day Scott entered the land of extreme in ECW. A few months after his debut, we would learn about a girl who attended the same camp as Raven and Dreamer. She was rejected by Tommy due to having acne and being overweight. Raven would end up getting with the girl and years later he found her again. She was now a penthouse model and she also had a vendetta against Tommy for rejecting her all those years ago. Her name was Beulah McGillicuddy, and Raven was using Tommy's past to hurt him in the present. The feud with Tommy Dreamer, seen by many ECW fans as the premier rivalry of the entire company, one that was deeply personal and one that allowed Scott to really show off what the Raven character was all about. Raven's nest was cultivated during the Dreamer feud and fans understood who Raven was when the rivalry cooled off. It never ended though, and it never really ended due to the two working together again long after ECW. But the 1995 portion of the angle was a great way for Raven to get his message across to viewers at home. 
There was also the time when Raven made the Sandman's own wife and son turn against them. Raven used his powers of persuasion to brainwash Sandman's family, and there's probably no better way to make things personal and get the upper hand against the enemy. Tyler and Laurie became members of Raven's Nest and they would follow Raven's commands. The ultimate goal was to mentally destroy the Sandman, and this rivalry would give us one of ECW's most controversial moments, the crucifixion of the Sandman. Raven spoke about this moment in a 2014 shoot interview and he said, I knew I needed to come back with some sort of impact and I thought, man, why don't I crucify the Sandman? That'd be great. I've always said that Raven is a martyr for society's dysfunction, and so now I'll make Sandman feel how I feel. I'll make him a martyr for society's dysfunction now and let him feel my pain. Upon his debut in WCW, we would learn that Raven still had the ability to somehow control people. Stevie Richards, a member of the original Raven's Nest, came over to WCW with Raven and immediately Raven began treating him poorly. Stevie was an associate of Raven's, he accompanied Raven to the arenas and he sat beside him in the crowd, but Raven would abuse his friend and treat him like dirt only for Stevie to be right by his side again the following week. Raven's debut match in WCW was a clash of the champions 35 against Richards. Raven won the match and the story didn't get a chance to wrap up due to Stevie leaving the company, but I'll assume that he would have remained part of Raven's flock as the faction grew. In WCW, Raven was given a lot of pre-taped vignettes which was surprising seeing as the company was so laser focused on the NWO. These vignettes repeated a lot of what was already said in ECW but they were spared some better production values as Raven talked about his abusive father, the kids who bullied him at school, and how he was going to repay society at large for banishing him and leaving him out in the cold. If you're not a fan of ECW's presentation, then the WCW vignettes are a good alternative, though the overall grittiness of the ECW promos suit Raven way better, in my opinion. Raven's feud with Perry Saturn in WCW is also worth looking back on. This was, in my opinion, the best example of someone turning their back on Raven due to Raven's insistence on treating people poorly. Saturn and Raven were friends growing up and Raven would say he was always there for Perry during Saturn's darkest times. When things went bad between the two though, Saturn would say that Raven was actually spoiled rotten as a kid. He had everything he ever wanted and all this talk about Raven having a rough childhood was make-believe. Saturn kinda struggled to leave Raven's side but he finally had enough and he wanted to leave the flock. Raven, however, wasn't about to let Saturn just walk out without putting up a fight. Raven agreed to grant Saturn and the whole flock their freedom if Saturn could beat him on pay per view. If Raven won, however, Saturn would be Raven's servant forever. In the end, Saturn was able to defeat his former best friend and the group would disband, bringing on a pretty significant character evolution for Raven that maybe did him more harm than good. In WCW, anyway. It would turn out that Saturn was telling the truth, Raven did come from a well off household and he was a spoiled kid growing up. After the flock disbanded, Raven's world came tumbling down and he ended up refusing to wrestle matches. He took some time off and when he came back, his character backstory was explored more, highlighting some contradictions. His home life was explored in some vignettes that aired on WCW television and in a way, this kind of changed everything we knew about Raven. He wasn't mentally abused, he wasn't treated poorly as a kid, he had everything he wanted. Raven, however, had visited some mental institutions and when his mother asks him to go back, Raven refuses to do so. These vignettes also brought Chastity back, a former member of Raven's Nest, and they also introduced the Sandman to WCW audiences. Many fans enjoyed these vignettes for the humor involved, while a few hardcore Raven fans didn't like them at all. What a mark! Even today, it seems like a sore point judging by comments made online. Raven was much more like a spoiled rich emo kid in comparison to the gritty, deep thinking anti-social grunger that brought him to superstardom. The feedback is mixed on the character evolution, though I'll repeat that many fans found the vignettes very entertaining. In the WWF, Raven didn't get a chance at all to build or evolve the character. 
Paul Heyman understood the importance of Raven getting mag time, whereas it felt like the WWF just saw him as another former ECW guy who should get thrown in with the other ECW guys. So those traits of Raven being a loner and non-conforming were thrown completely out the window. I could talk on about this, but I want these videos to remain character focused so we won't get into the nitty gritty of it all. But in comparison to ECW and WCW, Raven's WWF run simply didn't provide him with any opportunities to grow or evolve as a gimmick, which really was, and still is, a shame. In TNA, Raven kinda reverted back to what brought him to the dance, and for a while it was extremely successful. Raven became the NWA champion at Slammiversary 2005, but down the line TNA tried to introduce their own version of Raven's nest named Serotonin. Raven would punish members of the group for losing matches, it had that same kind of thing going on where Raven looked down on members of his own faction, but there were no long term plans for Serotonin and it just kinda fizzled out. TNA fans rank Serotonin as one of the weaker groups that ever appear in the company. Through TNA though, and even on the Ring of Honor and the Independence, Raven remained as an alternative wrestling character, making alterations to his attire and moving on from the grunge look as the years went on. Raven's character stood out a lot in the 90s due to how well Scott nailed down the look and motivations behind the character. It was the right time and the right place for Raven to shine during the mid 90s and it's a character that can never be replicated due to the changing of time itself. The gimmick embodied a shift in culture, it encapsulates a time period and therefore I don't think we'll ever see another Raven again because it just wouldn't work as well as what it did in the 90s. Sure, other superstars can come along and psychological warfare can be their main offensive weapon, but to do it the way Raven did with all the self-loathing, self-pity and his overall need for acceptance while decked out in band t-shirts, a leather jacket and a flannel wrapped around his waist, it just wouldn't hit the same at all. It's one of those things that could only rise within ECW. There was absolutely no way Raven could have debuted in WWF during early 1995 and the same is very true for WCW in 95 all. So, so even if you weren't a fan of ECW at the time, there's absolutely no denying that the company's existence would give us great, more contemporary characters that did a much better job of targeting the young male demographic. Raven was so multi-layered too that fans looked at him in many different ways. You could hate the guy, you could feel sorry for the guy, you could see him as this tortured soul or you could see him as plain irresponsible and that's why it was so good. His motivations weren't always clear, he did things to get revenge for a past we only heard about from Raven himself, yet he could verbally paint a picture to get viewers to understand where he was coming from. And his overall look, his attire and how he carried himself to and from the ring perfectly fit into this character he was trying to get across. You actually believe that Scott Levy was the Raven character and in my opinion that's where the money is. The Sting character had one of the most radical changes in the whole history of pro wrestling, made even more notable due to how popular Sting was and how far the original character had taken Steve Borden in terms of overall success. The blonde Sting, known by fans as Surfer Sting, gave many people a reason to tune into WCW programming. Viewers love seeing the Stinger take on all competitors while fighting the good fight week in and week out, but in the mid 90s, things simply had to change. WCW completely shifted direction when two outsiders joined the company, threatening to take over the entire organization and take away the WCW that Sting flourished in. The Stinger was the first to step up to these outsiders and he made it clear that he was ready for the war that Scott Hall and Kevin Nash were about to bring to the company that meant so much to him. While the arrival of the New World Order served as the catalyst for Sting's transformation, it was something else that pushed him over the edge and turned him into a new character. It was the lack of trust the company and his peers had in him when the NWO began playing mind games, and fans were introduced to a new, darker Sting that was heavily influenced by The Crow, a comic book character and movie character that came from the mind of American writer and artist James O'Barr. Let's look at the creation of The Crow version of Sting and let's Let's look at what made the character so successful.
On screen, Scott Hall was Sting's enemy, but backstage it was Scott who suggested that Sting changed his character into this dark vigilante. Surfer Sting wore neon colors, he came out to a cheesy but admittedly awesome early 90s rock song, with lyrics about how he makes the kids in the audience go wild and how the old people start acting like children when the Stinger's doing his thing. This worked well in the early 90s by the way, and even when the NWO came along, the original Sting character was still immensely popular, but there was a shift going on in pro wrestling where these cartoony characters and white meat babyfaces were getting phased out in favour of darker, more gritty and edgy characters that resonated better with the young male demographic. Hulk Hogan even shed his trademark red and yellow gear in an effort to update his overall look for this new era, Randy Savage would soon do the same thing, and while colourful characters most definitely still had a place in pro wrestling, it seemed like adding a little grittiness to a gimmick worked wonders for some of the biggest stars in the business. Scott said that Sting was a little standoffish when he first approached him, Sting didn't know Scott too well at all, and it sounds like Sting thought Scott was maybe poking fun at him at first, when Scott told talked about Sting's old blonde hair and colourful ring attire, but Scott said he would give advice like this for the betterment of the entire company. If WCW's doing good business, then Scott's doing good business, so he liked to offer his take on things whenever he felt it would improve the television product, according to Scott anyway. Sting took the idea to Bischoff, Bischoff liked it, and the wheels were set in motion to present a new version of the man called Sting. So, to quickly summarise what went down, the Outsiders came along and they had a match with Sting, Lex Luger and Randy Savage, the Outsiders then revealed their third man, and it was Hulk Hogan, the NWO was then born at the end of Bash at the Beach 1996. Sting would continue to fight the good fight on WCW programming, trying to save WCW from this takeover, but the NWO were able to convince Sting's peers and other WCW employees, including the commentators, that the icon had actually joined the group and he was going to fight alongside the NWO in the 1996 War Games match at Fall Brawl. Lex Luger and the Horsemen weren't sure if they believed Sting when the man himself said he wasn't part of the New World Order. Things were made even more confusing when Sting jumped out of an NWO limousine to attack Luger in a parking lot, so the WCW guys felt they had every right to question Sting's motives. But Sting said it wasn't him who attacked Lex and the group needed to believe him if they wanted to overcome the NWO. It was revealed that the NWO had brought in a fake Sting, an imposter that was added to the group just to mess around with the real Sting and Sting's teammates. The real Sting entered war games, he took out the fake Sting, and he demanded to know if this was good enough for Lex and the Horsemen before walking away and leaving his teammates to take a loss on pay per view. On Nitro the very next night, Sting came out and he addressed his actions before announcing that he was now a free agent. He was disappointed that no one believed him, he was upset that some fans also thought he was part of the NWO after everything he had given to World Championship Wrestling. He called out the announcers for their lack of faith too, and Sting walked away from WCW to pretty much let the NWO do as they pleased. Sting went to Japan briefly to work a few matches and when he came back he wore black and white face paint. You can see that the shape of the face paint still resembled the old Sting in a way, but as time went on the paint would cover more of his face and more black accents were added around his eyes and around his mouth. The NWO wanted Sting to join the group for real and Sting didn't say yes but he also didn't say no. But the only thing that's for sure about Sting is nothing's for sure. And Sting wouldn't talk into the mic again on WCW until January of 1998. Scott Hall didn't read the Crow comics, he watched the 1994 movie starring Brandon Lee, but seeing as the comic serves as the true genesis of the Crow character, we're going to focus on the comic books here and you're going to quickly learn that many of the original Crow's characteristics actually match up to the Crow's Sting character in WCW. Now I will be taking some liberties here too, Scott just watched the movie and he thought Brandon Lee looked cool while appreciating the darker tones of the Crow character. The comic book wasn't looked at before, during or after Crow Sting's debut, but I think it's good to look at this character inspiration from the absolute ground level, plus it's more fun. The 
The Crow made his first appearance in Calibre Presents issue number one, not including any artwork or advertisements made for his first appearance. Calibre Presents issue one was published in January 1989, and The Crow appeared in the story Inertia that served as a short prequel and introduction to the character. Over the next few months, The Crow's first limited series was published, four issues that were named Pain, Fear, Irony and Despair, and it was through this first series that readers learned all about The Crow and what the character was all about. A fifth book named Death was unpublished by the way, but it did get released later on. Let's draw some comparisons to The Crow and Sting next, and again, there are some liberties taken here, but everything I say will make sense if you let me indulge you for a moment. Eric, the protagonist in the original Crow comics, is killed by a group of thugs along with his wife. Sting, the protagonist in WCW, is in the middle of WCW getting killed by a group of thugs. Eric is resurrected by the Crow some time later and he plans on getting revenge for the people responsible for killing him and his wife. Sting's character looks to get revenge on the people responsible for killing WCW. I know, I know, the lives of a man and a wife seem like a weird comparison to a wrestling company, but wrestling is weird anyway, so just roll with it. The Crow's Sting, at its core, was all about bringing WCW back to what it was by taking out the men who were hell-bent on taking it over. In the comics, Eric's makeup is described as joyful. We see a masquerade mask in his house and Eric takes inspiration from that very mask that hangs on the wall. The original Crow Sting, before he somewhat evolved, had the exact same face paint more or less and it worked wonders for this new dark vigilante Sting. Even more so seeing as Sting used to wear face paint before. Think about it, if this was someone who didn't wear face paint before then it might not have came off as good. In the comics, the crow's abilities, or his magic as it were, the ridiculous strength, the agility and the reflexes, it's all driven by vengeance and at its core it's derived from lost love. The antagonist being separated from someone that meant the world to him, or her in later comics. Sting, meanwhile, is driven by the loss of WCW. Everything he knew was rooted in that company and he was at home in WCW while representing everything that was good. The NWO, the bad guys, were determined to destroy those roots and completely wreck every single tradition and cornerstone that made WCW what it was. And Sting was trying to save all that while also internally dealing with his peers who at one point didn't trust him. Speaking of which, Sting didn't do anything to prove how trustworthy he was, instead he made people prove how trustworthy they were. He would offer WCW wrestlers a chance to strike him with his baseball bat, the Stinger's weapon of choice during this era, and if no action was taken then the wrestler was considered Sting's ally. Still though, Sting wouldn't worry too much either about hurting his allies in order to infiltrate the NWO. He even joined the group for a while in order to get closer to Hollywood Hogan and the plan worked very well. Seeing as Sting didn't wrestle during the early days of the Crow gimmick, he would make his presence felt by sitting in the rafters and watching over everything that happened in the ring. He stalked his opponents from high above, keeping an eye on what was going on within the NWO and within the WCW Crusaders that once turned their back on him. Sometimes he could be spotted, other times he was nowhere to be found, but Sting instilled a lot of paranoia within the NWO and it was all very effective both from a storyline perspective and from the perspective of viewers watching at home. No one had done anything like this before and you gotta give Eric Bischoff credit for putting off Sting's eventual return to the ring for as long as he did. When Sting was ready to get back in the ring at Starcade, WCW made a lot of money and the creative booking up until that point was perfect. Anyway, the threat of Sting was always there. Even if Steve Borden was in another city or state, it never had to be explained on TV because his home on TV shows was away from the spotlight anyway. And this whole thing with the icon living in the shadows and striking at the most opportunistic times was what made it all work. 
The NWO were dominant throughout mid-96 to late-97, but even when they launched attacks on their enemies, they always had Sting in the back of their minds. Was he gonna strike or wasn't he? Would Sting fall for the NWO trap or did he see it coming from a mile off? The fear of Sting played a big part in the early storyline arc and, in the case of Hollywood Hogan, the fear of Sting could make someone irrational. To cope with this fear, Hogan would say Sting's actually afraid of Hollywood. Hogan built this fantasy in his mind that Sting was hiding in the shadows because he didn't want to face Hogan one on one. Even when Sting made it clear that he wanted to fight Hogan and no one else, Hollywood still tried to convince himself and anyone that would listen that Sting's the one sitting in the rafters shaking like a leaf, while Hollywood's in the ring looking to settle things once and for all. There was good stuff here, and yes, some of this stuff is only really there if you look for it and no doubt a lot of the nuance and tone wasn't intentionally planned by WCW in advance. One could watch Nitro week after week and say it's the same stuff every week with little to no progression, but the numbers don't lie. WCW Nitro destroyed WWF Raw during this time period and a lot of that was thanks to the Sting vs NWO storyline. Sting didn't need to do much and he didn't have to say a thing to still get people to tune in, so it's a classic case of less is more. The anticipation for what was inevitably going to happen was off the charts, and it's all down to how WCW presented Sting during this time period. In the comic, Eric's mission was to take out the gang who killed him and his wife one by one before getting to the group's leader, T-Bird. Sting would do the same before getting to the NWO's leader, Hollywood Hulk Hogan. It can be quite difficult to talk about highlights of this gimmick because of the nature of Sting's appearances. Watch episodes of Nitro, hope that Sting strikes the NWO and there you go, you've got a highlight of the crow Sting. Every time he did this the crowd would lose their minds and the excitement of the audience comes across on TV really really well. And besides, the highlights are made even better because you didn't necessarily know if Sting was going to strike or not. But still, I want to point out some other key moments that go a long way in painting this character and letting us know what he's all about. The Sting promo after Fall Brawl 96 on Monday Nitro is absolute must see for those wanting to study the gimmick and learn about why Sting changed into this dark and mysterious vigilante. Hearing Sting getting angry on a personal level is very different. This one feels much more authentic than his previous promos, so hunt this one down and you'll understand why Sting did what he did. It's one of the more memorable promos of his whole career. The 21st of October 1996 episode of Nitro where Sting gets asked to join the NWO is an important night too. This one's fascinating from a character standpoint because you sort of get half of the old Sting and half of this new Crow Sting. We also learn here that Sting isn't going to give away his hand and let the NWO know how he truly feels about them. And we also hear Sting talk for the very last time for nearly a year and a half. WCW uncensored events get a bad rep, but the 1997 edition closed with a great Sting moment. The NWO were victorious in the main event, but just before the show ended, Sting finally showed everyone that his allegiance was with World Championship Wrestling. The Stinger attacked Hall, Nash and Randy Savage, and he also attacked Hulk Hogan as the crowd went nuts. Everyone left the show knowing that Sting was gonna bring the fight to the NWO and eventually he'd be coming for Hollywood Hogan soon and the World Heavyweight Championship. A personal favourite Sting moment of mine happens at the very end of Clash of the Champions 35, the last ever Clash show. The NWO were celebrating their birthday at the end of the event, the lights begin to flicker and this low sustained note played in the arena that really added to the atmosphere. Up in the rafters we could see Sting with a vulture perched on his hand, and then the This Is Sting monologue played for the first time, a monologue that describes Sting's mission and why he seeks vengeance against the NWO. When a man's heart is full of deceit, it burns up, dies, and a dark shadow falls over his soul. From the ashes of a once great man has risen a curse, a wrong that must be righted. We look to the skies for a vindicator, someone to strike fear into the black hearts of the same men who created him. The battle between good 
and evil has begun. Against an army of shadows comes a dark warrior, the prevailer of good, with a voice of silence and a mission of justice. This is Sting. The Vulture then sits on the ring ropes as the NWO look on in fear, not knowing what to do as that low sustained note continues to play in the arena. On the 13th of October 1997 edition of Nitro, a bunch of fake stings came to the ring at the very end of the show to confront the NWO. These fake stingers had been synonymous with the New World Order and they were used frequently to swerve fans and swerve viewers at home. This time though, one of the fake stings hit Buff Bagwell with a scorpion death drop, only to reveal himself as the real sting afterwards. They pulled this one off really well by playing with your expectations, and the audience absolutely lose their minds when they realise what just just happened. Finally, and I know it's a sore point for a lot of people, but the Starcade 1997 main event is worth bringing up. I know the finish was a mess, but Sting's entrance, the stare down in the middle of the ring, the atmosphere inside the arena, it was all undeniably excellent. It's a shame things turned out the way they did, and the ending of the bout definitely overshadows everything else about this match, but the anticipation moments before the bell rings is on another level. Later in the comics, it's said that the crow's abilities are taken away if the antagonist abandons his or her mission, and the abilities also diminish when they consider their mission complete. If we take this and play with it a bit, you could consider Sting's mission coming to an end at Starcade 97 when he defeated the leader of the NWO, because really, the Sting character was never the same again. He would begin to talk a lot more, he wasn't as invincible as he once was, and he didn't seem so much driven to protect WCW but more so to hold on to the WCW championship while the NWO began to implode due to infighting within the group. Sting would eventually abandon the white face paint in favour of a red version when he joined the NWO Wolfpack, and during this time in particular, anything that remotely resembled the white and black version, in terms of his motivations, were completely gone. Yes, the Wolfpack did fight with NWO Hollywood, but Sting wasn't this lone wolf anymore, he wasn't a vigilante that stalked his prey from up in the rafters, he was just like everyone else who had a problem with Hollywood Hogan. Still though, the white and black version of Sting would make a comeback to WCW and he would once again appear from the rafters before taking out his opponents. But again, it wasn't the same, he was tangled up in usual, more traditional storylines that didn't expand upon the core characteristics of the gimmick. The same's true for Sting's time in TNA, WWE and AEW, with the only real big deviation being the Joker Sting that appeared in Impact. This character was of course inspired by Heath Ledger's portrayal of the Joker in the 2008 film The Dark Knight, and judging by comments made online, in retrospect, it seems that fans are split on the insane icon. Some fans liked it, others didn't. The crow sting that walked out on WCW Nitro in 1996 though serves as the foundation for the sting we still see on AEW television today, and it proves the overall longevity of the character. Surfer Sting in modern times wouldn't look right at all, so what Scott Hall and Sting did back in 1996 was create a wrestling gimmick that was once maybe a necessity but ended up standing the test of time. Many, many fans grew up with the crow sting and they know very little about his early days. Sting is generational though, and it really doesn't matter which version of Sting you were most fond of or which version of Sting you grew up with, he'll always be one of the most successful and popular superstars of all time. During the WWF's new generation era, a lot of new characters debuted that showcased a real lack of creativity. Duke the Dumpster Drozzy, Bob Sparky Plug, The Goon, Jean-Pierre Lafitte, Aldo Montoya, Isaac Yankum DDS, all these guys were put on TV in the mid-90s when business was already down, so needless to say, WWF were going through a few hardships and none of these new characters were catching on. There were exceptions, mind you, but these were few and far between. 
At the end of 1995, though, one of the most memorable, risky and creative characters that ever graced the wrestling ring came from the mind of Vince McMahon and it was a character that would, without a doubt, cause a lot of controversy. It's almost like the character's mission was just that, to create controversy and to get people talking. That character was Goldust, portrayed by Dustin Runnels, and while Goldust could easily have been an experiment that lasted a few weeks before getting put in the bad idea file, Dustin made the character work and Goldust would become a success story in the world of pro wrestling. Dustin Runnels was known to fans as the natural Dustin Rhodes during his time in WCW. The son of the son of a plumber, Dustin was a no-nonsense Texan boy who, at the time, didn't have much of a character but that's because he didn't really need one. Being the son of Dusty Rhodes was more than enough. Still, Dustin stood out on his own and WCW fans warmed up to him before he left for a brief stint in WWF during the early 90s. Following this short run in New York, Dustin returned to WCW where he spent the next four years as a fan favourite. And again, WCW fans enjoyed seeing The Natural in action. He became a two-time WCW Tag Team Champion and two-time United States Champion during his time in WCW. Following the well-documented King of the Road match, Dustin was fired from World Championship Wrestling and he decided to go back to WWF where Vince McMahon would present him with a new character that was very, very far away from the natural. As a matter of fact, it was far away from anything WWF had ever presented before. Through interviews with Dustin and through Bruce Pritchard's podcast, we can learn a bit more about how the Goldust idea was pitched to Dustin. But before we do that, let's take a look at some of the original concept art for the character and other characters the creative team had in mind for Runnels upon his return. First, we can see that a regular cowboy gimmick was considered. This doesn't look too far away from the natural character, but admittedly, it looks very safe and, dare I say, a bit boring. Shadow Roads was another idea that made Dustin look like some sort of Mad Max character perhaps. Kinda gives me vibes of a post-apocalyptic biker or scavenger of some description, but who knows what the real idea was here. Stargate Dustin Runnels looks like an Egyptian guard of sorts and I'm so happy WWF didn't go with this. This kind of thing falls into that wacky 1995 new generation nonsense that had a track record for failing hard. And then we come to Goldust. What you're going to notice in these Goldust designs is that there's no face paint involved and, at one point, the designers thought a turquoise colour scheme might suit this new character. According to Dustin, Vince McMahon didn't envision Goldust wearing face paint. McMahon instead saw Goldust overdoing it a little with makeup similar to Adrian Street and Adrian Adonis, but Dustin suggested paint had covered his entire face because it was something he personally wanted to do. Dustin loved how Sting and the Great Muda looked in WCW and he always wanted to wear face paint similar to these guys, so Vince gave it a thumbs up. There's one word that was repeated to Dustin over and over again during that first phone call with Vince. A word that Dustin had to look up when the call ended because he didn't know what it meant. And that word was androgynous. When Dustin went home and looked up the word in his dictionary, he would have read a definition like this. Androgynous, having both male and female characteristics, looking neither strongly male nor strongly female. It was at that moment when Runnels wondered just what he had gotten himself into, yet it's also very important to remember that throughout this whole character pitch and during the early days of the character's development, Dustin was all in. Ronald said he was excited to play a new character, he was eager to get away from being just the son of Dusty Rhodes, and he wanted to do something widely different in his pro wrestling career. I think it's important to remember that Dustin wanted to try this new character just as much as Vince wanted the gimmick on TV. Vince only really told Dustin that Goldust was androgynous and not a whole lot more. On the Chris Jericho podcast, Dustin said, Vince is like, yeah, you'll be this androgynous character and he mentioned Adrian Street and Adrian Adonis. So I remembered them and how they presented their characters and things like that. I'm like, okay, that's kind of cool, just this flamboyant person, right? 
That's what I thought androgynous meant, was flamboyant, and it's a little different than that. But he presented that to me and, you know, I sunk my teeth into it, and it took me a good six months up there to figure it out. So Goldust was shown his costume, he heard his entrance music, the folks at WWF made him feel pretty good about this new character, and everyone, including Dustin, thought a lot of money was gonna get made. Goldust was first revealed to WWF audiences through a series of pre-taped vignettes, and it's through these early vignettes where we can see exactly what the original concept was all about. We know that Goldust was to have both male and female characteristics, and in the 90s, this was going to create a lot of noise. But there's way more to Goldust than just sexuality. Hollywood, motion pictures, and film direction were also a key part of the Goldust character, and it's incredible how all this gets overlooked. Goldust would quote movies to get his points across, he would talk about his opponent starring in his latest blockbusters, he himself even looked like an Oscar award statue. But all this is overshadowed by every other trait that Goldust brought to the table. More on this in a moment though. Let's talk more about these debut vignettes. Goldust was obsessed with Hollywood. He said, It's the place where dreams were made and dreams were shattered. His favorite actor is Marilyn Monroe, and he says there's a difference between the actors of Hollywood and Goldust. Actors are manufactured and cloned by teams of managers, producers, and directors. Actors spend a lot of time learning to be something they're not, and that's the key difference between actors and Goldust. Goldust was born a star. He then said he was coming after Diesel's WWF Championship and he had held an award ceremony bigger than the Oscars. And in another vignette, Goldust called out The Undertaker and the Creatures of the Night. The creatures follow The Undertaker, but gold sheds no darkness, it only sheds light. Another vignette was directed at Shawn Michaels. Goldust said there would be a permanent vacancy at the Heartbreak Hotel, and he also said he was going to swoop down on the pink and black hitman like the Dark Knight. Simply put, no superstar would shine brighter than Goldust, and Goldust was going to make sure of it. As time went on, Goldust would quote movies while telling the fans the film in question along with the actor and the year it was released. House of Wax, 1953. In terms of his overall look, Goldust was very, very unique. The bodysuit, the face paint, the golden robes, the wig, he definitely stood out and he immediately made people take notice. When it came time to put Goldust in the ring and show this new character to live audiences and viewers around the world, things went a little downhill. His debut match happened at In Your House 4, he wrestled Marty Jannetty, and Goldust admitted that he was scared to death and he wasn't sure exactly what he was supposed to do. You can also see this in his other 1995 performances, and I remember even commenting about this very early in the Reliving the War series on my channel. Goldust looked the part, that's for sure, but the more unique and risky things he would do in the ring didn't come right away. As a matter of fact, he just seemed like any other wrestler, only he had the benefit of a unique costume. Dustin said that Vince gave him a lot of freedom with the gimmick and he also gave Goldust a lot of time to develop. He said, He, Vince, was 110% behind the character. He was hands on and he gave me a lot of rope when everybody else, like the clique, were trying to get people fired and whatnot. Didn't matter, he was going with me. So he let me take my time and find the character and it took about 7 months. Savio Vega was the man responsible for bringing Goldust out of his shell. On the AEW Unrestricted podcast, Goldust said, It took a while and then I started working Savio Vega. And Savio would try to get me to try these couple of things that were just way over the line for me. I'm from Texas, I was raised kind of in the country, so I'm a country boy and I'm scared to death. But that's when I realized that to make something successful, you have to step out of yourself, outside of the box, and you got to create some magic of your own. You just can't be scared all the time, you gotta take a chance. We were in Madison Square Garden, this was a special night, that's why I'm telling you the story. Savio finally talked me into doing this thing. We go out there, we start wrestling and having our match. I was Intercontinental Champion at the time, he locks up with me and he says, ok, we're going to do it now. So all it was was me locking up, going behind him, rubbing up and down his chest and kind of grazing over his private downstairs. And then he pushes me away and chases me and I take a powder. That's it, that was it. 
The place, for the first time in like six or seven months, erupted with every kind of profane thing just thrown my way. And it was like, holy shit. It was so simple and I was so scared to try that. I couldn't believe the reaction. It was major heat because you did not do that back then. So I roll in, Savio's in the corner and he's laughing his ass off. I walk up to him and I'm like, what are you laughing at? He's like, I told you, I told you man, we're going to do this again. I'm like, what are we doing? So I backed up in the corner, he says, I want you to spin me around and turn around and rub your ass on my crotch and I'll push you off and you take a powder again. That's all I did and they were louder this time. Right then in Madison Square Garden, I found gold dust and from that point on, it was a magical, magical run for a couple of years. Old Savio is quite the unsung hero when you think about the work he did for other guys in the company, including Steve Austin, but there you have it. Savio Vega was the man who brought the more risque side of Goldust out and from that night on, the restraints came off. Bruce Pritchard stated that not once did Vince McMahon or anyone in creative suggest that Goldust was supposed to be a gay wrestling character. Fans were very much encouraged to wonder and question Goldust's intentions and preferences and that was also supposed to be the whole point of Goldust being androgynous. It was supposed to be this giant question mark. Goldust was a master of mind games, he did the things he did to try to get in the mind of his opponents, and he would try to gain an advantage by making his enemies wonder, what's up with this guy? Of course, it's easy to look at Goldust and see the whole thing is nothing but exploitation or perhaps a cheap way for WWF to poke fun, but over the course of the character's story arc, we would learn that Goldust was a happily married man and he had a young daughter. His wife even became his manager very early on and while their relationship wasn't made clear right away, it was easy to tell they were close. So, in essence, Goldust used suggestive and risky in-ring mannerisms to try to get in his opponent's heads, or at least that's what Dustin and WWF were trying to get across. Emphasis on the word trying. In a way, it was more about exploiting homophobia. Goldust didn't have a problem with how he acted in the ring. His wife didn't have a problem with it either. The only folks who could have issues with Goldust's mannerisms and actions were the folks watching at home or Dustin's opponents in the ring. But as it would turn out, a lot of fans at home did have a problem with it. And it reached the point where the character would have to tone things down and eventually cease to exist for a short period of time. But we'll talk about that a bit later. Either way, Goldust provoked reactions with some of these reactions being more visceral than others. Vince McMahon, on the final episode of Superstars in 1995, flat out said that Goldust plays into the homophobic fears of others to gain an advantage. What the homophobic fears, if you would, so he can gain an advantage. Well, he said this in the middle of the Goldust and Razor Ramon rivalry. And also, while on the subject of the whole Goldust isn't gay thing, while I absolutely think there was enough room left for fans to wonder if that statement was really true. Dustin himself said that he came under attack from homophobic fans during his early days as Goldust. You'd only have to look at fan signs and listen to the crowd shouting at Goldust to know that this is true. So even if Vince McMahon said the character wasn't supposed to be homosexual, there was more than enough there to make fans draw their own conclusions. I mean, Goldust was kissing guys, filling guys up, sending love letters, grabbing their crotches and whatnot. Nothing was off limits. But it's important to remember that this was all supposed to be Goldust's way of playing mind games. It was supposed to be all psychological. And absolutely, 100%, it's not a character that could get away with these kind of actions in modern times. To be clear also, I know that Pritchard and others say things in interviews that could be very different from what was discussed backstage. This goes without saying, but I know people are going to bring it up in the comments. But do keep in mind also that Goldust was flat out asked if he was queer in the middle of the ring during an episode of Monday Night Raw, and he said no, he wasn't. Aren't you? What, what am I? I know, we, we might want to uh, be right back. Queer? No. Further proving that Goldust did what he did to mess around with his opponents and gain a little heat from the wrestling fans of the 90s. I'll just repeat that. Gain heat from wrestling fans of the 90s. 
You see, people's attitudes towards gay men during this time period was heavily driven by false information and lies surrounding the AIDS crisis during the 80s. News sources and figureheads spread misinformation that turned victims who needed help into society's outcasts, and this, in turn, made the general public less accepting of gay men, to say the very least. Also, when Goldust rose in prominence during 1996 and when the character was in full swing, the Defense of Marriage Act was signed, an act that defined marriage as only between a man and a woman by federal law. Not only did this deny marriage equality between any two human beings who loved each other, it further isolated and discriminated against gay men and women. Being isolated in this way and being wrongly looked upon as degenerates creates room for controversy and ridicule. And here walks in a wrestling character who's been told to act in a way that's going to bring controversy and perhaps ridicule that comes from the same mindset. Goldust was developed to create controversy. Vince knew it, Pritchard knew it, and Dustin Runnels knew it. You can't watch Goldust in 1996 and say that he didn't push buttons to get a reaction. That would be absurd. And absolutely, being a villainous wrestler who implied that he liked men made many fans look at Goldust like some sort of bad joke, and it also makes WWF look insensitive. But Goldust and the fans' overall perception of Goldust is also a great case study for how times have changed over the years. There are many folks, particularly those who have the ability and honour of reaching a wide number of wrestling fans through the internet, who look back at this character today and call it one of the worst and most unforgivable things WWF ever did. So I felt it was important to hear from LGBTQ fans in regards to Goldust and listen to their take on the gimmick, seeing most of the takes out there via Google and YouTube search are from straight dudes. My perception, and indeed the perception of morally grandstanding journalists, YouTubers and critics, could maybe be different from those with different preferences and lifestyles, and I wasn't surprised to learn that the majority of people just enjoyed the character for what it was and they appreciated the work that went into it. But to be fair too, there were also a few folks who were offended and felt that the character was a setback. Of course, along with this you get the odd Twitter hero who wants to turn everything into an argument, but by and large, folks were more drawn into the psychological aspects of Goldust rather than the suggestiveness of his actions. Expert Bandit said, This was one of the better gimmicks I ever saw. When he pulled that wig off for the first time and I finally realised who it was, let me tell you, I was shocked. Shocked, I tell you. Emily said, I always found the Goldust character very amusing and fascinating. His initial WWF run started brilliantly. He broke boundaries and provided the most entertaining content during the bleak period of WWF. I also enjoyed his 2002 and 2003 run with Booker T. Here's one here that said, I liked it because it was a great gimmick. I'm lumped with this LGBTQ plus thing as if we were monolithic, but I bet everyone has different viewpoints. I was a big fan of Dustin pre Goldust, and so I was more shocked it was him rather than the queer overtones. Truly a great character. Super Rasby, WWF was gimmick central in 1995 and it easily could have failed, but Dustin had the talent to pull it off. He played Goldust like an outrageous John Waters character and could wrestle well enough that the matches were worth it too. He was more than just Dusty Jr, his WCW victim. Chris says, I feel like because it was so cartoony and so out there and not true to life that it's hard to be offended by it. Lou said it was 1996 and wrestling, that's my opinion. Here's one here, I found his character in the mid 90s to be funny and awesome. As a strange teenager myself, I could relate to him especially when I got in character. As a bisexual I found him amazing, funny and groundbreaking, at that time I never knew other bisexuals existed. And in the interest of fairness, here are some of the more negative comments. Kimberly's Ghost says, The way the Goldust character was portrayed in his first three years is a fascinating and alarming insight into how Vince McMahon views homosexuality. The Scottish Nerd said, Great character, but at the start it was just hateful and poisoned every LGBTQ plus character for like 10 years. The Stern J said, The gimmick wasn't the issue, but the way they talked about it was, like when Lawler was on commentary dropping the F slur and then promos, Dustin did great in the role. Something Neon said, The way that Dustin portrayed the character always outshined the shittiness intended by writers or how the moral pillar of wrestling Jerry Lawler talked about him. Both he and Dusty somehow found ways to turn baffling ideas from creative into iconic characters in their own way. 
Lexi says he was definitely a negative representation for us at the time, and as a trans woman who was still questioning herself at the time, he probably delayed me coming out by quite some time. That initial character fits exactly the same type of attacks we suffer today. Brian said, It's a bit of a mixed bag for me. I was still in high school when he debuted and not out myself. I found the character to be different and refreshing, but when he was a heel, the homophobic hate he got was pretty offensive. There were a lot more tweets sent my way in regards to Goldust and I couldn't include them all in this video, but have a look at my Twitter profile and you'll see for yourself that a lot of people, the majority of people, just liked the character and they had fun watching the character. For sure though, there are people who feel a bit more strongly about the WWF's intentions when presenting such a gimmick in the mid 90s, and that's absolutely fine too. It shows us how the character and the presentation of the character affected different people in different ways. Personally, I love the psychological aspects of the character and I got a kick out of seeing Goldust doing more provocative actions while inside the ring. When Goldust found his stride in 1996, he was one of the WWF's most entertaining aspects and he was so unique and different that he stood above everyone else in terms of character. There's no way that you can't see the character as a risk, especially in the mid 90s, but I think it paid off and Goldust proved to be one of the more fascinating gimmicks the WWF had presented in a long time. At the same time, though there are folks out there who have the opposite opinion as evidenced by the tweets I received. For these people, the Goldust character could have a much more profound personal effect than what it would for me, and so these folks look at Goldust and the general idea of Goldust in a much different way. These people should never be overlooked and maybe that payoff I talked about was at the expense of these wrestling fans. How you feel about the character is your own personal choice. If you loved it, great. If you found it offensive or too close to home, that's fine too. But whatever way you felt was what the WWF were going for. The more controversial it became, the more it got people talking. That was the whole point of the gimmick. You don't push the envelope without expecting some people to get upset over it. And you're the only person who can decide if that's right or if that's wrong, not some dude who writes opinion pieces on the internet. What's also evident though is that the majority of those who found it offensive weren't necessarily angry or upset with Dustin, they were more angry or upset with the WWF. The Razor Ramon feud that began in late 1995 is worth going back to watch. It was Goldust's first big rivalry, and what's noteworthy here is the fact that Scott Hall did not want to work with Goldust at all. Scott wasn't into the Goldust character, he didn't like how it was presented and he didn't like the way Goldust acted in the ring. But still, Scott would end up dropping the Intercontinental Championship to Goldust in a storyline that really did give fans a lot to talk about. Goldust made it clear that he liked Razor, he liked Razor so much that he got a little Razor Ramon tattoo on his chest and he even sent Razor letters and gifts. The bad guy said he couldn't read the letter on TV due to it being unsuitable for younger viewers, so it all played into the mystery of Goldust. In the end, the mind games worked, Goldust defeated Razor Ramon at the 1996 Royal Rumble and he won the IC belt in the process, so the ends justified the means. The Hollywood backlot brawl at WrestleMania 12 is an interesting matchup. Roddy Piper didn't hold back when addressing Goldust, and many of the things Piper said would raise eyebrows today. But Goldust took it all in his stride, and he used Piper's insecurities to mess around with the hot rod even more. Some of the promos that Goldust cut in the run up to WrestleMania 12 were fantastic. Piper got the better of Dustin at WrestleMania 12, but Goldust showed everyone how tough he was during the backstage part of the matchup. He took some very stiff shots in this one. The lingerie he wore under his gear later in the show was a Dustin Ronalds idea. He revealed that he had to get approval from Vince McMahon. There's also an excellent Savio Vega vs Goldust match that happened on Raw on the 15th of April 1996. This isn't the match Dustin talked about earlier, but it's a good example of how comfortable both Savio and Goldust were in the ring together. If you want to see Goldust push every button imaginable, then this is the one to check out, and the rematch the following week. Finally, there's a Goldust vs Shawn Michaels dark match from In Your House Buried Alive. This can only be seen on the WWE's Attitude Era Volume 3 unreleased DVD and Blu-ray, but I made a video about the match on my channel. It's a fun little bout with Goldust singing Shawn's theme before the two have a great match that should have been on the pay-per-view itself.
There were many places this character could go in 1996 in particular, but things got watered down a lot when sponsors and viewers, mostly parents, complained about the character. According to Vince Russo, USA Network were getting a ton of complaints and Goldust was on the verge of costing WWF some big brand deals while also putting existing sponsorships in jeopardy, so everything had to get reined in. Goldust would turn babyface, he would explain in a series of interviews that Goldust was created so Dustin could step away from his dad and so Dustin could be his own person. The gimmick was all toned down and this resulted in everything that made the character unique not being there anymore. Then, towards the end of 1997 and due to the antics of D-Generation X, the USA Network realised that the more risque WWF got, the more people were tuning in, particularly young males. So Goldust ended up turning heel again after ditching his wife Marlena in favour of Luna Vachon. This gave fans the artist formerly known as Goldust and things then got really bizarre. The artist wore colourful outfits, colourful wigs, he had a gag on on occasion. Other times he was on a leash, it was like Goldust was put into turbo mode with absolutely no brakes and no creative restraints and to be honest, I didn't think it hit nearly as hard as the original Goldust. As mentioned earlier, the psychological aspects of Goldust was what drew myself and others into the gimmick but the artist felt like it was only done for shock value. On top of this, the character just wasn't that successful, there were no championship reigns, he wasn't featured on a weekly basis, and eventually it was phased out in favour of Goldust pretending to be other people like Hunter Dust, Marilyn Dust and uh, Dusty Dust. Knowing that the character was falling out of favour, Goldust pitched the idea of getting breast implants to Jim Ross, Bruce Prichard and eventually Vince McMahon. This was all confirmed by Dustin Ross and Pritchard by the way, and of course Vince McMahon did not allow it. Jim Ross wrote in his first book, The hot creative ideas were slowing for the Goldust character and we had all been brainstorming for new ideas. Dustin comes into a small room at Madison Square Garden, takes a seat and proceeds to tell me that he has an idea that will put him back on the map. With a film crew present, he wants to go under the knife and have a breast implant procedure, essentially making him the first female character in sports entertainment history. He suggested that he would be huge on the talk show circuit and people all over the world would be clamouring to see the bizarre one in person. I was shocked at what I was hearing. Here I am, this Oklahoma farm boy sitting in New York's Madison Square Garden having one of the most unique conversations of my life with a large man with a bleach blonde buzz cut who wants to get a bona fide boob job. He indicated it would be worth the sacrifice because the character would be the hottest new thing in the world and the money would be rolling in for everyone. I said he really needed to speak to Vince McMahon, the chairman of WWE on this one, as I did not feel comfortable approving this elective surgery from my talent relations budget. Vince had an astonished look on his face and as he told me later he thought he was being ribbed. It was not a rib. After Dustin finished, Vince explained that he appreciated Dustin attempting to develop new concepts for the character and continued to brainstorm on them. Still, Vince did not think this particular creative idea was the direction we wanted to travel. Later, I asked Goldust then wife, Terry, if she knew about this concept and she answered, rolling her eyes and nodding her head. That pretty well covered it. Dustin would end up burning the Goldust outfit on TV, he became a born again Christian, and he would then end up bringing the Goldust character back again, but again it wasn't the same as before. When he went back to WCW, the creative geniuses had him debut a new character named Seven just for the sake of working the audience with a shoot promo and killing the character off from the moment he got in the ring. And then he just reverted back to good old Dustin Rhodes. Over the years, Goldust would make returns to WWF where he had good times and he had bad times. As Emily Rose mentioned in her tweet earlier, he had a memorable run with tag team partner Booker T that many fans enjoyed. People are going to remember Goldust stuttering his words and having a mild case of Tourette's during this run. But the allure and the mystique of the character was never recaptured and to be honest, it was always impossible to do such a thing all these years later. Still, Goldust will always be part of Dustin Runnels as evidenced in his AEW run. I love how he incorporates his old character into his AEW face paint. Goldust was put away for good but there's still elements of the character that stayed with Dustin as he began his journey in all elite wrestling. Today, Dustin doesn't play up to the character or the gimmick, but he doesn't shy away from showing everyone that it was a big part of his career, and he's held in very high regard by fans who tune into AEW every week due to the work and effort he put into his craft. 
35 years this man has wrestled for and he shows no signs of slowing down. As a matter of fact, many believe his greatest match happened in 2019 when he faced brother Cody at AEW Double or Nothing. Whether you saw Goldust as a genius idea, an underhanded and shitty way for WWF to poke fun at people, or just another wrestler in a world filled with over-the-top gimmicks, Goldust will always be very, very memorable. I've said before that I wasn't fond of his babyface runs in WWF, particularly in 1997, and I also said that I wish Goldust could have kept doing what he was doing during the early days of the gimmick, but no matter what I or anyone else thinks, Goldust will always be one of the most interesting and fascinating characters in pro wrestling history. You could actually say he was the man who really kickstarted the Attitude Era years before the phrase Attitude was used in WWF. And he was right, he said it all along, we will never forget the name. Him. Gold dust. Nineteen ninety two was a year that signified the end of an era, standing as a murky no man's land between the golden era of pro wrestling, the most critically and commercially successful period in the sport up until that point, and the ongoing new generation era which would have the exact opposite effect on the industry, very nearly rendering pro wrestling unsalvageable in the United States. Stars of the past would cling to their relevancy while younger talent gave a glimpse of what could be if they were given an opportunity to shine. However, there was one man throughout this time period who could be seen as somewhat of an anomaly. Matt Bourne had made a name for himself during the late 70s and throughout the 80s, but he'd be given a new lease of life in this new era of pro wrestling. Outlandish and over-the-top gimmicks were becoming more prevalent around this time period and it would be this rapid shift in creative direction that would lead to the invention of one of the most memorable personas in the history of the business, Doink the Clown, a gimmick that could only be created in this murky no man's land of early 90s WWF, yet a gimmick that was effectively held back by its era. Matt Bourne, real name Matt Osborne, was a deeply troubled man outside the ring, but it's undeniable that when he channeled those demons into his portrayal of the evil clown, it made for one of the most interesting and compelling characters to appear on WWF television before or since. Matt Osborne grew up in North Carolina as the son of Tough Tony Bourne, a well-known wrestler throughout the Portland Territory. When he was a young boy, Matt's mother walked out on him and his father, the pain of which would stay with Matt throughout the rest of his life. He'd follow in his father's footsteps and make his pro wrestling debut in 1978, primarily working for Pacific Northwest Wrestling in Portland much like his father before him. Using the ring name Matt Bourne, which we'll use to address Matt throughout this video, he developed a reputation as a standout in-ring worker with his style being described as that of a whirling dervish, constantly being in motion and making his matches look like a fight as opposed to a series of choreographed sequences. He would make his way throughout the territories, but his most notable appearance throughout his early career came in 1985, performing at the first WrestleMania in a losing effort to Ricky Steamboat. It must be noted that despite how good Matt Bourne was in the ring, outside of it he was seen by many as unpredictable, abrasive and somewhat of a bully. Despite his reputation though, Bourne would continue on an upward trajectory, ending up in WCW in 1991. While in World Championship Wrestling, he was given the character of Big Josh, an outdoorsman who played on Bourne's Midwest roots. He would leave the company in 1992 and following a meeting with Vince McMahon, he was offered a chance to return to the World Wrestling Federation on a more consistent basis. The origins of how the Doink character came to be are about as mixed up and convoluted as the man who would eventually portray it, but the most commonly believed story is that Road Warrior Hawk saw Bourne sitting in the locker room after a match looking unkempt and wild. He had one boot on, his hair was all over the place and he was smoking a cigarette. It was this image that made Hawk exclaim that Matt looked like Krusty the Clown, the surly children's entertainer from The Simpsons. I could pull a better cartoon out of my ass. <laughs> hey, whoa! 
Before continuing on, I wouldn't be surprised if the Road Warrior Hawk story was true. It would seem that Hawk was fond of suggesting creative ideas backstage to the boys, with one of his greatest triumphs being the smoking skull belt. Steve Austin confirmed that the whole custom made belt idea came from the Road Warrior himself. So with Matt looking like a complete mess and this Krusty the Clown idea in his head, Bourne and Vince McMahon would work on the character's appearance, going through a number of incarnations of Doink's now iconic ring attire and face paint. In regards to how Doink would act outside the ring, Matt took inspiration from his father's old tag team partner, Lonnie Moondog Mane, a notorious prankster back in his day. And along with Mane, Matt also looked at Cesar Romero's portrayal of the Joker in the original Batman TV series from the 1960s to gain further inspiration. The Romero influence was evident in regards to Doink's over-the-top movements as well as his signature laugh. One of the seemingly more obvious inspirations for the Doink character, at least from an outsider's perspective, was that of Pennywise, the evil clown from IT. Stephen King's novel which would later be adapted into a TV miniseries. However, according to those involved in Doink's creation, Pennywise wasn't even mentioned throughout the creative process. Bruce Pritchard claimed that the inspiration for the character instead came from the 1988 film Killer Clowns from Outer Space. On the surface, this sounds ridiculous, but given how out of touch WWF always seemed to be in regards to popular culture, there may well be some credence to it. Despite this, given the overwhelming success of the IT television series and comparing the time that the show aired, November 18th and November 20th, 1990, and given when Doink debuted, it's undeniable that there were similarities between the two evil characters. Pennywise was one of those horror characters that practically everyone knew about back then. The TV miniseries became very popular and Tim Curry's portrayal of this cosmic entity that took the form of an evil clown was incredible. Even if Vince McMahon himself didn't use Pennywise as inspiration, Matt Bourne almost certainly did. On a very basic level and away from the main children characters in the book and TV series, Pennywise would appear harmless, a goofy and silly circus act that would lure the children of Maine into a false sense of security through his playfulness. When the time was right though, Pennywise would turn into an absolute monster to feed on his prey. And while not as blatant or as violent as this, one could compare Doink's mannerisms to Pennywise in regards to how one moment he was happy and smiling, and the next he was menacing and quite sinister. More on this later though. When it comes to the main protagonists of the book and miniseries, Pennywise was much more psychological in his approach. He would invade the minds of these children and later full grown adults in hopes of causing severe mental torment. Doink too would be quite the fan of mind games. Rather appropriately, Doink would make his WWF television debut on the October 31st 1992 episode of Superstars, appearing in the crowd during a Tatanka vs Dale Wolf match carrying a large mallet and a balloon animal. His involvement was limited to mere seconds of screen time, but it left fans wondering why a random clown was parading through the audience with no build up whatsoever. Things like this create intrigue, it makes people talk, and just the mere sight of Doink was all people needed really to begin speculation. No introductory videos, no storm in the ring during a match, no interview to present himself and his motivations. All you needed to do was look at this guy and that was enough to begin a discussion. Over the following months, audiences would see more of the facets which made up the Doink character, such as playing pranks on his opponents and those in attendance, all to the backdrop of his deeply unnerving entrance theme which wouldn't have sounded out of place in the IT TV miniseries. His ring gear was a mixture of traditional clown makeup and a wig and a brightly coloured singlet which invoked memories of a court jester or harlequin. By the end of his matches, that grease paint would become smeared and smudged while his blistering green hair would become dishevelled and bedraggled. But from beneath it all would be that sinister scowl, sending a message that yes, whilst he may be dressed as a clown, if you didn't take Doink seriously, the joke would very much be on you. The point of a pro wrestling character is to conjure up an emotional response, and clowns in general tend to elicit a reaction one way or another. Colrophobia is one of the world's most common fears, but despite how prevalent it is in society, there's never been a concrete explanation as to why so many suffer from it. 
According to the largest and most recent survey conducted by PJ Tyson where 987 adults from 67 different countries participated, a whopping 53.5% 528 participants had a fear of clowns to a certain degree. So the idea of an evil clown in an industry that's all about exaggeration and being over the top, it seems fairly logical. Having a TV character where these fears could be played upon to the utmost actually makes sense when you consider how much of the population don't like clowns. You also take Matt Bourne who, as mentioned earlier, had a reputation as a wild man outside the ring, whether it was getting into fights with fellow wrestlers and fans or his well documented issues with addictions and paranoia. It's almost like he was perfect for the role through his own personal traits that admittedly would be seen as negatives. When asked about the character, Matt was quoted as saying, a demented clown. I mean, a demented clown ought to be kind of a scungy son of a bitch, you know? I mean, I've been around enough guys in the wrestling business that I know how to portray that. As negative as Matt's personal traits were, when channeled into a gimmick such as this, it helped to create a multi-layered character in an era where these simply did not exist, at least in the World Wrestling Federation and WCW. Upon entering the arena, Doink would have a huge smile on his face and he would walk down the ramp with a manic energy. However, he would suddenly stop dead in his tracks, his grin would disappear, and he would stare down the lens of the camera with a darkness behind his eyes that would send a chill down your spine. Was this vacant stare just to play mind games with his opponent as well as those watching at home? Or was this who the man behind the paint really was? Were the pranks and laughter acting as his cover? Was he trying to lure people into a false sense of security like another character we talked about earlier on? Little things like this would add a nuance to Doink that many would overlook if they just caught a brief glimpse of him, and indeed many did overlook the nuances of Doink which was, and still is, a terrible shame. To be fair also, ring time and even promo time back then was much more limited. You had very little time to present yourself during this era so you had to make the most of those precious television minutes. If a fan missed Doink on an episode of Superstars then you might not see the character again for a few weeks, so the way WWF Wrestling was presented back then kinda limited what a character like Doink could have and should have become. It wasn't through lack of trying though, and those who watched all of Doink's early appearances would tell you that there was much more to this guy than just a silly costume. Once inside the ropes, the commentators would be quick to point out that while Doink's choice of attire was unusual to say the least, behind the red nose in the Gary singlet lay an incredibly sound technical wrestler, a man who had the ability to tie his opponents up in knots just as effortlessly as it would be to simply punch them square in the jaw. Vince McMahon on multiple occasions would state that Doink was one of the very best technicians that the sport had to offer, so there was a concentrated effort to get the wrestler over just as much as the character he was portraying. Throughout his matches, Doink would attack his opponents with hard hitting offense and painful submission holds, but he would also take the time between his assaults to smile and laugh, showing those watching just how much he enjoyed his work. While applying his stomp puller finisher, Doink would look squarely down the barrel of the camera with the look of a man who showed absolutely no remorse for the pain he was inflicting on a fellow competitor, often refusing to break the hold even after his opponent submitted. One of Doink's more memorable characteristics were the pranks he would play on both fans in attendance and on his fellow superstars. Whether it be gifting a child at ringside a present only to find that the box was empty, or stealing a wrestler's entrance jacket while they were in the middle of a match and placing a kick me sign on the back of it, Doink always made sure he had fun at the expense of others. He would throw water on people, leave banana peels around ringside for wrestlers to slip on, and he would squirt people in the face with a flower he had attached to his jacket. When Doink would target those in the audience, he primarily went after younger fans to elicit the desired reaction, that being making them upset or even making them cry. The WWF would go as far as to get close-ups of the children in the crowd looking as frightened as possible when Doink would make his entrance, and all this helped to make the character much more menacing and scary to younger viewers watching at home. Despite dressing like a clown and acting like a clown, it was never explained why the man behind the paint adopted this particular persona. This, in turn, would lead to speculation by the commentary team. Bobby Heenan put forth the idea that this was all mind games. This man was too good of a wrestler to simply be a clown. This is not a clown. This isn't a guy that goes around and passes out candy, makes people laugh, makes people happy or sad. 
This is an accomplished wrestler. And he has taken on, he has taken on this persona as Doink the Clown because he's trying to send a message to somebody. He's up to something. This man has a plan. He's too good a wrestler to be a clown. He has a plan. The image of the grease paint revealing more of the man underneath is as much as would go on was inadvertently a fantastic metaphor for the character itself. The layers of the facade would peel away to reveal what truly lay underneath it all. A sinister, disturbing and unpredictable man whose sole purpose was to make sure that everyone around him was as miserable as he was. The original incarnation of Doink didn't even last a full year. From his on-screen debut in October of 1992, Doink would leave his evil ways in September of 1993 when he turned babyface by dumping buckets of water over the heads of Bobby Heenan and Jerry Lawler. The king had appointed Doink to be his court jester, by the way. So there wasn't much of an opportunity for the character to have any real standout feuds or matches in the short time frame. Yes, there were memorable moments, but as far as prolonged angles were concerned, there really was only one, and that was his feud with Crush in early 1993. On the January 2nd 1993 episode of Superstars, Doink was at ringside for Crush's match as he would frequently do for various other wrestlers, and on this night he decided to squirt water in the faces of some children sitting in the audience. Following his match, Doink would antagonize Crush, who in turn grabbed the clown by the arm and warned him to stop terrorizing those in attendance. The next week, Doink came out in a sling and he offered Crush a flower by way of apology. The big man accepted the gift and went to leave, but Doink would reveal that the arm he had in his sling was a false one, later said to be filled with batteries and lead, and Doink would proceed to attack Crush from behind with this comical yet very effective weapon. Doink would strike Crush repeatedly throughout the assault with that sinister scowl etched on his face before eventually relenting and walking back up the ramp laughing maniacally. The ferociousness of the attack shocked audiences as that level of violence had rarely, if ever, been seen on WWF television to that point. This all culminated in their match at WrestleMania 9, the bout featured an infamous finish where a second Doink appeared and he helped the original Doink pick up the victory. The two would then do their now iconic mirror spot while Crush was laid out. And even though WrestleMania 9 is seen as a low point for the company, the image of the two Doinks lives on forever. Later that year at SummerSlam, Doink would compete against Bret Hart as a substitute for Jerry the King Lawler, who, by the way, was faking an injury to get out of the match. Before the match began, Doink would throw a bucket of water over Bret's brother Bruce, much to the delight of Bobby Heenan on commentary. This bout showcased Doink's abilities as a pro wrestler, going up against the man who was deemed to be the very best that the company had to offer in regards to in-ring skill. Doink was able to show off the vicious side to his character, utilizing the ring post to damage the hitman's leg before displaying his technical proficiency while utilizing a number of holds, all while zoning in on and weakening the injured body part. The match would eventually be stopped on account of interference from Jerry Lawler who attacked Brett while he had Doink locked in the sharpshooter, but this outing proved that Doink could hold his own against the very best and it made him look like a credible threat to the rest of the WWF superstars, despite what his appearance would lead you to believe. Sandwiched in between those two events was the King of the Ring tournament where Doink took on Mr. Perfect in the opening round. The two squared off on the May 1st episode of Superstars, however the match ended in a time limit draw. The rematch was scheduled for the May 16th episode of Wrestling Challenge but once again the time limit expired and no winner was declared. The third and final match was then set for the May 24th episode of Monday Night Raw. Perfect was an excellent foil for Doink as he was arguably the best all-rounder in the company, and his ability to sell an opponent's offense helped to drive home just how vicious this character of Doink really was. Beating job guys on weekly TV is fine, but at a certain point it can't go any further, so a guy like Kurt Hennig had the ability to truly showcase an opponent's offense and this worked really well for Doink. As both men were top tier in ring talents, it's unsurprising that these matches are somewhat hidden gems in regards to the standards of 1993. Having an opponent like Mr. Perfect allowed Doink to not only get over his wrestling ability, but to get over the other quirks of the character such as the manic laughter and the trickery he would employ, all while allowing Perfect to show that he too had a vicious streak, having to attempt to beat Doink at his own game in order to put the clown away. 
Perfect would win the third and deciding match after Doink attempted to use the same tactic from WrestleMania 9, using a second Doink to attempt to steal the victory. But Perfect would make quick work of the second Doink, thereby advancing on in the King of the Ring tournament and leaving Doink to come up with a new diabolical scheme for his next opponent. One more match I want to bring up is Doink vs Marty Jannetty from the June 21st 1993 episode of Monday Night Raw. This one went for 20 minutes, somewhat of a rarity during these early days of the World Wrestling Federation's flagship weekly show. Many consider this episode the absolute best the WWF had put on up until that point. Doink and Jannetty had met the previous week but the score would be settled in a 2 out of 3 falls match. And the psychology and storytelling displayed in this one really showed us how good Doink was as a character and how good Matt was as a pro wrestler. Doink used much more of his technical abilities here rather than falling back on character traits. He planned on injuring Marty to the point where the former rocker couldn't utilize his usually effective aerial attacks and it was this laser focused onslaught that gave Doink the second fall after losing the first. The trickery would then begin as the second Doink once again reared his ugly head. Matt hid under the ring and the second Doink won the third and final fall, but Macho Man Randy Savage made sure justice was served and the referee awarded the match to Marty Jannetty. A great showcase match here for Doink and one that comes highly recommended. As mentioned earlier, the heel version of Doink didn't even last a calendar year, with Vince McMahon deciding to turn the evil clown into a babyface, portraying Doink as a stereotypical good time clown. As it would happen, Matt Bourne wouldn't last much longer anyway, as he would be released from his contract following repeated drug abuse offences. Matt would recall being fired from the company by saying, We were staying in Boston and I was smoking weed in the hotel, and I was fired, period. Why was I doing drugs? That's what I did. That's what addicts do. With Matt now permanently out of the company, the gimmick was bounced around a few people before finally being settled permanently on Ray Apollo. Doink would become a fan favourite during Apollo's portrayal of the character, he was used mainly as comic relief whilst continuing to pull pranks on various heels, albeit a lot more harmless than the outright cruel pranks from the previous iteration. And it was during this time that the character of Doink became synonymous among fans of, rather ironically, being a joke. Just to put this into perspective, in 1992 Doink was placed at number 26 in the PWI Top 5 100, but by 1994 Doink was named by the Wrestling Observer as the most embarrassing wrestler of the year, being involved in the worst feud of the year against Jerry Lawler and as having the worst match of the year taking place at that year's Survivor Series. While the bastardization of the character was taking place in WWF, Bourne was on the independents trying to forge out a living with a new version of the character, most notably in the early days of Extreme Championship Wrestling. Matt would wrestle a few matches as Doink before Shane Douglas criticized Vince McMahon for turning someone as talented as Bourne into a cartoon character, and this prompted Matt to take on the persona of Bourne again. This version of Matt Bourne would have him wearing the Doink outfit but with only a small amount of paint on his face and no green wig. Upon defeating his opponents, he would put the wig on their heads and berate them in a way like he was screaming at the past version of himself. It was very well done. Whilst the Born Again gimmick did have some legs, it was quickly shut down when Vince sent legal documentation stating that the Doink character was his copyright. Matt would counter sue, claiming that he was still owed money from the WWF for things such as merchandise, so as a compromise, Vince paid Matt his residuals and Born stopped using the gimmick. Doink would appear sporadically in WWF and WWE throughout a number of years, even making an appearance in the gimmick battle royal at WrestleMania 17, while once again being played by Ray Apollo. Though Matt Bourne did get to don the grease paint as Doink in the WWE one more time in 2007. This happened on the 15th anniversary special of Monday Night Raw when he competed in a battle royal. The character of Doink can be seen as a microcosm of the World Wrestling Federation at that particular time. Something that started out with grand ideas and had seemingly unlimited potential, that being the golden era, morphed into a watered down parody of what it once was, the new generation. For that brief moment in time though, Doink the Clown was one of the most interesting and dare I say revolutionary characters in the history of pro wrestling. To have a gimmick with such depth and nuance at a time when wrestling garbage men and wrestling spacemen were becoming the norm, Doink stood head and shoulders above the rest, with those who followed him in the role unable to walk a mile in his clown shoes. 
Was the potential ever reached? No, I don't think it was. There were so many ways this character could go, but progression halted for a number of reasons. Matt Bourne was a deeply troubled and disturbed individual, residing in darkness for most of his life. However, it was that darkness that allowed Doink to shine as a beacon of light in this often ridiculed era of pro wrestling. It's a shame that the name of Doink the Clown is met by many with derision, almost creating a new and unjust legacy of a gimmick that was a failure and an embarrassment, being lumped in alongside those garbage men and spacemen that Matt was so determined to distance himself from. Thankfully though, in more recent times, fans have begun to revisit the original incarnation of Doink, and only now is Matt's portrayal of this evil character finally getting its flowers. At least these flowers won't squirt water in your face. You might think Stone Cold Steve Austin's a peculiar choice for this creating a wrestler series when compared to other gimmicks and characters I've already covered. Indeed, the fundamentals that make up Stone Cold as a wrestling character could be described on a basic level as the real Steve Austin with the volume turned up to 11. But who is Steve Austin before any volume gets cranked up? What really made Stone Cold so special and so endearing to viewers watching at home? I think it's a little dismissive to just call Stone Cold an embellished and exaggerated version of the real Steve Austin because there has to be something there initially to make that embellishment stand out even more. We can't just tell a bunch of guys to turn it up to 11 and expect record breaking merchandise sales, sold out venues and legitimate pop culture status. There has to be something there already that makes us gravitate towards certain superstars. Stone Cold Steve Austin arrived at the perfect time, he embodies an era of pro wrestling where typical babyface versus heel rivalries were yesterday's news, and still, to this very day, he's arguably the most popular and well loved superstar in the history of the entire business. Let's see what made it all work, let's see why it all worked, and let's see why no one could have made it all work other than Stone Cold Steve Austin. Steve Anderson was born on December 28, 1964 in Austin, Texas. His parents got divorced when he was still a young child and Steve would end up taking the surname of his stepfather, Ken Williams. Steve Williams got a scholarship to attend the University of North Texas where he would play as a linebacker but a knee injury would see Williams play as a defensive end. The WWF or WWE liked to point out the fact that Steve Austin was as blue collared as they come and yes, this was a very true statement. Austin said in an interview with ABC News. I guarantee you, my high school jobs were always working in the highway department driving dump trucks, patching up roads, digging ditches, driving a forklift. I think if I'd never had found pro wrestling, I'd be a blue collar guy working a 9 to 5 job. While driving forklifts and working hard to earn a paycheck, Austin joined a wrestling school, training once per week under gentleman Chris Adams. The school took place inside the famous Dallas Sportatorium, the stomping grounds for legends of the business such as the Von Erichs and the fabulous Freebirds. Austin was a pro wrestling fan from a young age, but after moving to attend university, he was able to go to the world class shows within the Sportatorium. So when Chris Adams advertised this wrestling school, Austin jumped at the chance. Steve wanted to do the things he saw on TV and maybe make a living out of it too. Austin's time at wrestling school wasn't great, Adams didn't smarten Steve up at all, and Austin said he only learned the inner workings of a wrestling match when competing in his first televised bout. The referee called his spots and Austin was a little dumbfounded to say the least. World class would merge with the CWA from Memphis, the USWA was then born. Dirty Dutch Mantel would give Steve the name Steve Austin because Dr. Def Steve Williams was already a pretty big name in the world of pro wrestling, and Dutch would make Austin sit at the curtain and watch each and every match on the card in order for Steve to improve his in-ring work. Dutch felt Steve wasn't ready for the big time just yet, so Austin had to put in a lot of extra time in learning his craft, something that Chris Adams maybe should have thought about when taking the little money Steve had at the time when training. Steve would go to WCW where he really made a name for himself. Stunning Steve Austin debuted in 1991 and later that same year he would join Paulie Dangerously's Dangerous Alliance. 
being in this stable didn't give Steve Austin credibility because he already had credibility, he deserved his place in this faction. Stunning Steve was a sound technical wrestler who hung in there with the best WCW had to offer at the time including the likes of Barry Windham and Ricky Steamboat. And while Austin wasn't as big of a name as say Rick Rude, Arn Anderson or Larry Sabisco, he still looked like he belonged in the Dangerous Alliance thanks to how good he was as a pro wrestler. He was a heel who could go in the ring and he carried himself like he was one of the best in the world. When the alliance broke up, Steve formed a tag team with Brian Pillman, something he wasn't too enamoured with at first but it turned out to be an excellent move. And things then went downhill for Austin during a feud with Jim Duggan in 1994. Austin was defeated by Duggan at Halloween Havoc and at November's Clash of the Champions show. WCW were more concerned about pushing former WWF stars around this time period and it really did look like Austin's time was up in World Championship Wrestling. The following year, while Austin was rehabbing an injury, Eric Bischoff sent the future Stone Cold a letter via FedEx that confirmed that he had been fired from the company. Bischoff felt there was no money to be made when it came to Steve Austin and Bischoff also felt that Austin was very difficult to work with. So Steve took himself to ECW where, for a brief period of time, he became superstar Steve Austin, a man with a chip on his shoulder for how he was treated by Eric Bischoff. Austin would poke fun at Bischoff and Hulk Hogan through his promos, he would make self-deprecating jokes about his run in WCW, and all this was important to Steve Austin as a character because it showed fans that this guy was very entertaining when taken off his leash. Austin had shown his comedic timing during his stint in the Hollywood Blondes, but Paul Heyman giving Austin a microphone and a platform without a typical wrestling script or scenario, this is what made people realise that this guy could be something special. Mick Foley was one of the first guys to realise Steve's potential, a potential that WCW and Eric Bischoff didn't even get close to realising. Austin then joined the WWF and he couldn't have joined at a worse time really. The WWF's new generation era did have moments of greatness and I definitely have a soft spot for the era as a whole, but a newcomer entering the WWF during this time period was already in trouble the moment they stepped in the door. Everyone needed a gimmick, everyone needed to stand out with a character that could either make or break their entire run in the company, and Austin got lumbered with the Ringmaster, a name that was given to Steve because Vince McMahon heard all about Austin's ability as a great technical wrestler. So Austin wasn't just great in the ring, no, he was a master of the ring. What's equally as bad is the fact that Austin was given a mouthpiece, and that mouthpiece was Ted DiBiase. The Ringmaster would debut as DiBiase's new million dollar champion, but practically Basically everyone who watched Austin in the Hollywood Blondes and in ECW knew that Austin didn't need someone to speak for him. It was a weird decision to say the least and it's not like an association with Ted DiBiase meant a whole lot in late 95 and early 96. Needless to say, Austin didn't like this ringmaster character and it wasn't long before he requested a change. And this is where things get interesting. What many people tend to forget is that Austin's initial gimmick change, the Stone Cold character as we know it, it was actually inspired by a serial killer. HBO released a documentary back in 1992 named The Iceman Tapes Conversations with a Killer. And this documentary was all about Richard Kuklinski, a man who claimed to have worked as a hitman for the mafia. Kuklinski got his nickname The Iceman due to how he had frozen one of his victim's bodies to try and fool the authorities in regards to the time of the victim's death, but it was Richard's cold attitude and lack of emotion that gave Austin an idea. Steve went to the office, he told them all about the documentary and how this cold blooded character with no remorse could work well for a wrestling gimmick, and the WWF took this idea of a serial killer and they produced a list of names that Austin thought were absolutely terrible. In retelling this story, Austin remembered three names in particular due to how comedically bad they were, Otto Van Ruthless, Ice Dagger and Fang McFrost. Austin got frustrated over the names, he couldn't believe how WWF could take this idea and turn it into a joke, and Steve said this on his bottom line DVD documentary. My wife at the time, Jeannie, she was from England. She makes me a cup of hot tea and she sits the hot tea on the table and she goes, don't worry, you'll think of something, just go ahead and drink your tea before it goes stone cold. She goes, that's your name, Stone Cold Steve Austin. So a serial killer who had ties with the mafia, the WWF given Austin some terrible suggestions, and Austin's then wife, Jeannie Clark, all these things were what created the name Stone Cold Steve Austin.
That ice cold serial killer thing just didn't help produce Austin's new ring name. In the very early days, it also affected his mannerisms. Those who watched Steve's very early matches as Stone Cold would remember his cold stare into the camera as he walked down to the ring, in the cold stare to the camera after Austin had beaten up his opponents. While it didn't last long, the original Stone Cold was quite different from the one who found immense popularity, but do take the time to go back and watch these early Stone Cold matchups. You can see the influence the Iceman documentary had on Steve Austin. The switch was flipped though at the 1996 King of the Ring. The Austin 316 promo was incredibly important in changing who Austin was as a character, and it was Steve saying, Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass, that made him a little more loose in comparison to the whole Iceman thing. And the King of the Ring promo also showed everyone that Austin didn't care at all about what others thought of him. The language he used, the way he addressed Jake Roberts and the way he addressed the fans, the way he said thumping the Bible got Jake nowhere and how Steve put the WWF on notice, it all came together perfectly and while Austin would remain quite cold hearted and self centered, he would also speak his mind a whole lot more without caring much about the consequences. What you really need to remember here and what you need to take into consideration is the general landscape of pro wrestling as a whole. The Austin 316 promo happened one month before the NWO debuted in World Championship Wrestling. And both of these events marked a shift in pro wrestling where being bad was now cool and being at the establishment yielded a much more raw crowd response. Times were changing, the days of a white meat babyface going up against the forces of evil was really played out, and fans wanted something a bit more mature they could rally behind because both WWF and WCW had been way too colourful and way too safe throughout the mid 90s. Teenage kids would be embarrassed to admit they watched pro wrestling, there was very little about wrestling that was cool unless you had access to things like ECW. And within the space of one month, here comes Steve Austin telling people he'll whip their asses if they step out of line, and here comes this black and white anti-establishment group trying to take over an entire organisation. Now, with all this in mind, the rise of Steve Austin was far different from what the WWE liked to say it was through their documentaries and whatnot. There wasn't a sea of Austin 316 signs in the audience following the King of the Ring, and all you have to do is watch Raw following the June 1996 pay per view to debunk that myth for yourself. Stone Cold Steve Austin really needed a strong opponent and a strong rivalry to really turn it up, and that opponent will get brought up later in this video. But I'd even go as far as saying Austin floundered a little following the 1996 King of the Ring. Yes, he did cut promos where he was able to show this new carefree attitude of his, and yes, he was able to show he was a relentless ass kicker who had no respect for officials, particularly Gorilla Monsoon and Steve Austin would disagree on a lot of things. But Stone Cold had to put in a lot more work following the 1996 King of the Ring, and that sometimes goes unnoticed. When Austin reached the very top of the company and when Austin claimed the WWF Championship, a new layer was added to his character, that being the common everyday man who was being oppressed by his bosses and those above him. Austin was always anti-establishment of course, but Steve turning babyface allowed the establishment to turn heel, and this means Austin's time would be spent fighting against his boss and trying to overcome his employer trying to make life difficult for him. The common man in pro wrestling was nothing new, and a certain American dream would base much of his persona on being just that. The typical American working class male who clocked in every day, put in a hard shift, went home to have a beer or two, then went over the same schedule the next day and the day that followed. It's probably the most relatable character or relatable gimmick in all of pro wrestling because it's technically not a gimmick. It's real, it's something that many people have to go through each and every day to provide a living for themselves and their families and it speaks to a huge percentage of the population. Mr McMahon, Steve Austin's boss, was a petty and vindictive man who didn't feel this bald headed, blue collar, beer drinking SOB was corporate enough to represent his company. Steve Austin being the face of the WWF was a PR nightmare in the words of Mr McMahon, and Vince was almost embarrassed to have Steve Austin at the very top of his company. Vince would even try to put Austin in a suit and tie, a way to make Steve fall in line and be the kind of champion that Vince feels he should be, but Austin announced that he would never change and no one was going to tell Steve what he can and can't do. 
It's a wonderful trait for a babyface and one that had never really been done before. Stone Cold Steve Austin represented the men and women of the world who wanted to tell their boss to shove it. He represented the men and women who worked hard at their jobs with little to no recognition. And while representing those adults who were oppressed by the daily grind of life itself, Austin was also very appealing to teenagers because, just like teenage kids, he didn't care about authority and he rebelled against authority at every given opportunity. The end result was insanely popular, it was insanely profitable. Stone Cold Steve Austin not only got himself over but he also helped turn the tides of the Monday Night War. He helped make an entire company relevant again and it was all because people could tune in and live vicariously through the Texas Rattlesnake. Being an over the top larger than life superstar is fine, when it works it works and the WWF in particular had great success with cartoon characters in the past but Steve Austin really was a new breed of superstar. One that got cheered for flipping the bird, one who got cheered for drinking beer in the middle of the ring. Austin could lose a match but still get the biggest pop of the night just for beating up his opponent after the bell. He truly was a remarkable performer that exploded in popularity at just the right time. I could spend hours talking about career highlights for Stone Cold Steve Austin, I really could. There's so many matches and moments that helped to create and evolve Steve Austin that I could legitimately make an entire video series on the subject and I wouldn't run out of ideas for a very long time. With this video though, I wanted to focus on the early days of Stone Cold and the things that make up the wrestler that is Stone Cold Steve Austin. So it would be foolish of me not to mention the Bret Hart feud that really kicked off at Survivor Series 1996. Austin got quite the push from Bret even before the two met in the ring at Madison Square Garden. Bret returned to the WWF just before the pay per view and he announced that Steve Austin was the best wrestler the company had to offer and that's why Bret wanted to face Steve at the 1996 Survivor Series. Austin had been making fun of Bret quite a lot while the hitman was off TV but that didn't stop Bret giving Austin his approval as a pro wrestler before the two locked up on pay per view. Austin vs Hart at Survivor Series showed everyone that Austin was the real deal. Those who watch World Championship Wrestling already knew this of course, but up until that point Austin didn't ever get a chance to really show what he could do against a highly proficient wrestler such as Bret Hart. The match had it all, but there is a focus here on technical wrestling, something that was reined in quite a bit for their submission match showdown at WrestleMania. And even though Austin didn't beat Bret in the garden, he still came out of the match looking like a million bucks. Austin knew he almost had Bret, he was inches away from beating the best of all time and this loss would only fuel Stone Cold's desire to one day beat Bret and get a little revenge. After a lot of turbulence and after further establishing himself as a badass who didn't care about the rules, see the 1997 Royal Rumble for example, Austin would then go into WrestleMania 13 where he refused to give up the Bret Hart sharpshooter. The fact that Austin wouldn't quit gave Stone Cold a lot and I mean a lot of new fans. Brett was doing a lot of complaining around this time of his career too which did help a lot in making Stone Cold a bit more favourable in the eyes of wrestling fans. But Austin showed a lot of heart when refusing to give up and this made fans gravitate towards Austin like never before. Following WrestleMania 13 Austin's attitude didn't change but a lot of fans attitude towards Austin certainly did and even Austin himself said that there would be no Stone Cold without Bret the Hitman Hart. It was one of the greatest rivalries in pro wrestling and it's one of those rivalries that helped shape the business in a big way. At WrestleMania 14 the Austin era began when Stone Cold defeated Shawn Michaels for the WWF Championship. While Austin admitted the match could have been better and while everyone knew Sean was going into the match in a bad way both physically and mentally, the importance of the match should never be overlooked. At one point in time I don't think anyone could have imagined stunning Steve Austin of the Dangerous Alliance or one half of the Hollywood Blondes winning the WWF title in the main event of Wrestlemania but that's exactly what happened in 1998. And immediately following this match, everything changed. Seriously, the whole tone of WWF completely shifted and it's remarkable how different the following episode of Raw's War was in comparison to the one before WrestleMania. Many people say the Attitude Era actually begun at WrestleMania 14 and that's not a statement for me to argue, but through my recent rewatches of every Raw episode of the Monday Night War, I found the Raw after Mania 14 to be undeniably different in both tone and content. In this new Raw's War that the WWF were going to present each and every week moving forward would quickly put an end to WCW's incredible win streak that they were benefiting from greatly in the Monday Night War. 
The Austin vs HBK match may not be the best match either man had, but it marked a very important time when looking at the entire history of the WWF and WWE. It's interesting to think about what could have been had Austin not won the championship when he did. Many would say that Steve Austin's greatest ever rival was Mr McMahon. Vince wasn't a wrestler in the traditional sense of the word, but he would step into the ring every now and then while fancying his chances against the Texas Rattlesnake. It speaks volumes to how good the storytelling was back then. You could book a Vince McMahon vs Steve Austin match and it would do better numbers than whatever two pro wrestlers were getting featured in the WCW main event. Austin and Vince collided many times, but I always enjoyed their cage match at WWF's in Valentine's Day Massacre in 1999. This fight encapsulates the Austin and McMahon feud quite well, with Vince being a slimy coward at the beginning of the match, Austin being relentless when he finally gets his hands on Vince. We get Vince McMahon using whatever underhanded tactics he can to gain an advantage, but he still comes up short and he ends up getting completely wrecked at the hands of Stone Cold. Vince had a plan all along, he had the debut and Paul White waiting under the ring, ready to attack Stone Cold at just the right time in order to give Mr McMahon the all important win. But in typical Vince McMahon fashion, the plan backfires and Steve Austin's able to come out on top. I remember watching this one live and being so impressed with that finish, great stuff. Again, Vince and Austin would have so many run-ins with each other that it's difficult to pick out an all-time favourite, but I find this in Valentine's Day Massacre match highly entertaining and it's one that really captures what the rivalry was all about. Stone Cold Steve Austin was a legitimate game changer for the World Wrestling Federation. Being such a consistent draw and being so important to the growth of WWF, it's hard to imagine Austin or McMahon wanting to mess around with the formula in fear of killing off the Golden Goose. Austin, however, wanted to turn heel again in 2001. He felt that his run was becoming a bit stale and he needed to switch things up in order to stay fresh and relevant. The turn happened at WrestleMania 17 when Austin aligned himself with Mr McMahon and the turn was nowhere near as successful as Austin initially hoped. I know I don't speak for everyone, but personally, I liked it. Stone Cold was already established as a vicious, no-nonsense fighter in the ring, but this heel turn allowed Austin to be quite sadistic and cold towards others in the company. Fans would still cheer for Austin though, which made Austin believe that the heel turn was actually a mistake and it's something he wished he put more thought into before pulling the trigger. The sadistic and cold side of the heel Steve Austin was put on hold in favour of a more comedic Texas rattlesnake, and while Austin was still a bad person with bad intentions, he was able to show off more layers of his character while adding little bits of humour here and there. The work he did with Kurt Angle was insanely good. Both Austin and Angle were vying for Vince McMahon's attention, and this would lead to some ridiculously funny stuff that still makes me laugh when I watch it back today. But when people think of Stone Cold's overall legacy, I don't think this kind of stuff's what instantly springs to mind. Following the invasion storyline, the decision was made to turn Stone Cold back to a good guy, though his days as an active full-time wrestler would soon be over. But Austin ended it all as that same Stone Cold Steve Austin that rose in prominence in the late 90s. The no-nonsense brawler walked into WrestleMania 19 for his final match against longtime rival The Rock, and even though Rock defeated Stone Cold, the rattlesnake left pro wrestling still at the top of his game in terms of popularity. He would return to the WWE as the Sheriff of the Monday Night Raw brand, which was also incredibly entertaining. His work right here with Eric Bischoff gave Austin more opportunities to show how much of a naturally funny guy he was. Austin did of course come back for one more match against Kevin Owens at WrestleMania 38, a moment in time that fans never thought they'd see. But again, it was the Steve Austin that we all knew and loved who showed up at WrestleMania in 2022. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So in short, there wasn't any real concentrated efforts to evolve the fundamental character of Stone Cold Steve Austin because it just didn't make sense to change things up. Stone Cold didn't need to change even when Austin himself thought otherwise. The legacy of Stone Cold Steve Austin and the importance of Stone Cold Steve Austin can't be put into words. He's a living legend, the embodiment of the Attitude Era. He played a vital role in turning the WWF around during a time when things looked incredibly bleak, and he really was a breath of fresh air that the company sorely needed at that time.
Steve Austin's rise in popularity marries up perfectly with the whole industry changing as a whole, making one wonder what the WWE would look like today had Austin never been given a chance. And while he had quite a few bumps in the road he had to overcome backstage on both a personal and professional level, Steve Austin will always be one of the most popular and well-loved superstars of all time. The term game changer does get thrown around quite a lot nowadays. Any new signing to a wrestling company instantly makes people reach for their phones to share how much this new signee means to the company as a whole. Stone Cold Steve Austin was a bona fide game changer that completely altered the course of pro wrestling and it would take nothing short of a miracle for his success to be duplicated by others.